Well, I made it to episode 20. And a lot of people are like, oh, they said I couldn't get there. They said I couldn't do it. And that's really not what this is. This is more of like a agreement that I've made with myself. A promise to stay consistent with this podcast. To keep it in there and to release weekly episodes on Wednesdays. Eastern Standard Time. I was trying 11 p.m. And I don't know how effective that was. So what I'm going to do going forward is probably just announce it somewhere on my Instagram at sessionrepspod at gmail.com for updates. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is just gregarious. And my Spotify, of course, is just sets and reps. Find me, give it a listen. If you're a new listener, it's really great to have you here. It's just me talking to people that I find really interesting at this point. I mean, all the guests that I've had an opportunity to meet have their own unique approach to wellness and the development of strength, whether that's mental or physical. This podcast is for the purpose of meeting them and bringing to myself and my listeners the words and the stories that they have to offer, whether that is in the psychological realm, mainly the physical realm and the athletics. I love speaking to coaches, but not only anything having to do with exercise and fitness, but even creators and artists and people that have a story to tell, but they've just chosen a different method to promote it. This whole thing is about expression. How are you going to take what you're passionate about and send it out into the world? Different people have ways of doing that. And they obviously got to put a lot of time and effort into it. That's where the idea of sets and reps comes from. You put in repetition over a long period of time. In general, you can think of that as your life. You have a long time on this earth. So live it out like it's one giant set and you got to put in the reps to get the results. You need something in there. That's how you're going to bring the consistency. And I promise myself to bring consistency to this podcast. I'm thankful that this is episode number 20. To me, that's a little bit of a milestone. My guest was pretty special too. I spoke to Eric Degatti, who's been in the strength and conditioning space, the athletic space the fitness and movement space for about 20 years now and aptly titled the episode is called experience is the best teacher and when I reached out to Eric at first I saw his accolades I saw the amount of time that he spent doing this and the different institutions and types of people that he's had the opportunity to step in front of and speak publicly to on top of being a personal trainer and a very knowledgeable one at that, he became a strength and conditioning coach, started working at a small gym, and ended up developing his own company that combined multiple different practices in the human body. Where he basically opened a facility and began training out of there. But the insights he gives me about training athletes, how all of these certain boxes need to be checked up before he even is hired as someone's personal trainer, Again, so grateful for the opportunity for me to learn from someone who has gone before. Without getting into it too much more, I'm just going to slide back and let you enjoy the episode. Okay, welcome back to the Sets and Reps podcast, episode number 20. I'd like to welcome my guest, Eric Degatti. Am I saying that right? Yes, you are. Perfect. Thank you. Welcome to the show. How are you feeling today, man? Uh, great. Thanks for having me. Perfect. It's great to have you here, man, especially for episode number 20. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a landmark for me, but um, when I first saw you on podcastguest.com, the directory, I was like, this seems like the perfect person to have um, on the show, especially because uh, experience is the greatest teacher. And I would definitely like to learn from your experiences today, um, especially being a new coach myself. Um, there's there's a lot of voices out there telling you a lot of different things. And when you stick to fact and you stick to science and what's worked and what hasn't, um, I believe that's what's going to make the most growth and the most progress. So once again, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Um, so let's start off. I know you've been on many walks of life. You've started your your own business. Um, that that's been an operation for a long time. Um, I want to hear a little bit about what your training philosophy is personally. I know every coach kind of has their, uh, their specialty or what they believe in stand by the most. So I, I'd like to ask you about that to start off if that's all right. Okay. So, I mean, 
the the ten thousand foot view of what the philosophy is is I I have an education model, all right, and and so I'm looking to empower everybody I work with, and so I kind of uh, coach by the the old proverb of if you if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day; you teach a man a fish, you feed him for life. And so my my greatest accomplishment is one of one of my clients can go off on their own, and they're working out in a gym, and and they're better than most of the strength coaches and trainers there because of what I've been able to impart to them and how they can better understand um, not only training, but more importantly, how to understand themselves and how to get the most out of themselves. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, and I'm sure you've worked with a lot of different populations. Did you always have a, a specialty or an area in athletics or did you start with general population? I uh, still have some general population people that'll come to see me. Um, and usually it's for a, uh, a specific need uh, that will get referred to me because, you know, hey, I've had low back pain and I've been to every specialist in the world. It's not a medical issue, but nobody can figure me out um, or, you know, swap out back pain for anything else. And I get those general population people. Um, I, I don't, uh, the only people that I do take on is by referral. Uh, mm. That's been that way for probably over 10 years. Um, and so I'll get referrals from, everything from medical doctors to coaches to uh, other clients. And so it ends up being an interesting spread of, of who you end up getting, even though most of my work um, in, the, in the last half of, of, uh, of my career has been mostly uh, baseball, softball, and football. Okay. Um, you said that you've been just working with referrals for a while. Before that, was it kind of like a, an open gym scenario where – uh, you'd have a lot of different people that are coming in and out and then they'd get training that way or? Uh, well, when I first started, I started in a big box gym um, okay. without really the intention of even being a trainer. I wanted to do something in the field, but wasn't sure. And the owner of the gym that I was training, I was working out of, uh, working out out of said, you know, why don't you become a trainer? And I became intrigued and, um, and then uh, basically started training people and realized how low the bar was set. Um, in our industry, unfortunately, and started to become, you know, started to experience some success early on. And I literally got to the gym at 5 a.m. And there was a, a little, you know, I'm going to date myself. There was a little cardboard corrugated box in the front. If you filled out a slip, you entered in there to win a free personal training session. So I'd get there at 6 a.m. and I'd empty the whole box and call everybody at 9 a, at 9 and say, congratulations, you won and come train with me. And I would train anybody that would listen to me for an hour. Um, and then eventually built a clientele from there to the point where it grew and I kind of grew out of the box gym thing and found a personal training studio up the road that I brought my clients there and, and rented space out of there. And then I eventually took that over um, and opened up my own place. And that was in 2002. So you really had that kind of um, that that drive, it seems like, to just to reach out to all those people and just make as many connections as you can. And would you say that that's part of the best ways to become successful in this industry is just by having that go out and get it type attitude. It's, it's really the only way no one's showing up looking for you. There's too many people in this business and there's too much, um, there, this, there's so much saturation of people out there that, that want to do this, um, that you have to be able to, you know, I, I wouldn't have gotten anywhere in my career if I didn't, if I, and I always say that the, there's a fine line between being persistent and being a pain in the ass. And I cross it on a regular basis. And so, um, the only way I've gotten in through, uh, through any of the channels that I have is, is, is through that and, and making connections and, and meeting the right people. And then, and in building relationships, those genuine relationships with those people, mm -hmm. meaning that, uh, once I started to, to, uh, to gather some success, I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, Oh, you work with so-and-so, or you work with these professional athletes or this team. I'd love to work with them. Can I, can you get me in? And it's like, no, that's not how it works. You need to like, we need to like dance the dance a little bit here and build a rapport and relationship. I don't know you, let alone trust you enough to, to open up my, my contacts list to you. So um, building those relationships are huge and you never know where they're going to go. I've had people that reach back out to me 10 years after I stopped training them and then they introduce me into something else or, or another opportunity. So you never know where it could lead. So it, the, the creating as many good honest relationships as possible is, 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 and being in holding up your end of those relationships is the most valuable thing in, in this or any business. And what I've also heard and believe is valuable too, just on top of that is like 
you know, after you build those relationships, keep them around, like, like don't burn your bridges. Right. Cause you never know where you're going to see someone else again. Like, just like you're saying, like you might see them down the road 10 years. Yeah. I, I mean, it let, it, I mean, I've had people set a lot of, slide, set a lot of bridges on fire around me, but I've never, <laughs> I've never lit one up. It's not, it just yeah. doesn't, I don't see where you gain from that. I'd rather just walk away and find another bridge. Absolutely, man. That's good. You'd be a really good builder if you were in that industry. So appreciate that. Um, so talk to me about one human performance. Did that develop out of the, or the idea for that, at least did, did that develop out of the space that you were telling me about up the road from the original gym that you started working at? Yeah, I had this vision, um, from working in, 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 uh, facilities and seeing what other facilities were doing. And they were, um, they made poor attempts at best at doing it. Um, but they, it really wasn't prevalent where you had a multiple disciplines in under the same roof. And what I mean by that is even when I was in the big box gym, we had a group fitness, uh, department, we had a, a new, we had nutrition consulting, we had personal training and none of them. And we, well, I think we had a chiropractor there too. None of them coordinated with each other. So if you went to the chiropractor, they'd say, oh, well, you shouldn't be taking that group fitness class. And the group fitness instructor will say, well, that's because the trainers don't know what they're doing. And the trainer would say, well, I don't know why the nutrition person telling you that you should be doing something else. And so, you know what the client ended up doing at the end of the day? I said, you're all idiots. I'm not going to listen to any of you. I don't yeah. trust anybody because there's no harmony here. So I wanted to take that and then build on that and create this development model where we can have under the same roof, a lot of those same things. And, and that's what one human performance was as a facility. We had a uh, uh, chiropractic sports physician. We had physical therapy. We had nutrition. We had performance coaches. We had personal trainers and having those all be able to communicate and have a standard operating procedure to know um, not only what everybody's doing and respect that, but also be able to appreciate where your scope of practice is and where it's not. And when do you need to call on that, that person to get them involved and how do you then communicate and have an open line of communication so for the best of the client or patient? There we go. Yeah. So you had that whole network there and, and everyone's kind of working uh, in unison with each other. And that's, that sounds like a great environment. That sounds like the perfect place that I'd like to be in. Um, is it the same as it is today, you know, as it was close to when you first started it? Um, so, um, and it's funny when I did started that in 2002, there was, there was no multidisciplinary centers. There really wasn't. Yeah. Um, okay. And so people thought I was nuts because no, none of those people played nice in the sandbox together. Mm. Um, and so to, to do that was, was not easy and it didn't always work perfect. Um, but it grew over time and I had the facility for about 12 years. And then what happened was, is I started to grow, um, my, my, um, speaking end of the business going out and teaching. Mm. And I also started to grow a lot of my consulting business and working out with other teams. So the problem was, is I was getting pulled out of the facility as much as I was in it. And I, and it was kind of, I got to a crossroads uh, where it was a matter of, I can either really grow this outside stuff, um, but I can't then do justice to the, to the facility or I can continue to grow the facility. Well, at that point I had taken the facility as far as I wanted to. It was a 10,000 square foot facility. We had, you know, eight trainers. We had all those things that we talked about and I never really got into the business to be a facility owner. I, I just built a place because there was no place uh, that had the vision that I wanted. And so I just built it myself. Okay. Um, so I decided it, at that point, after 12 years to, to walk away from the, the physical space, the, the brick and mortar, I kept the brand one new performance and I still operate under, under it today. Um, but I no longer have that physical facility. Now, if, if people need to see me, I have a, a partnership with a, a baseball school that has a gym space within it. And I rent space out of there for the handful of clients that I do see. Um, and the rest of the time I'm out, you know, doing teaching or, or continuing education or consulting or, or, or team contracts, that sort of thing. Amazing, man. What's the, uh, what's the main age group of the baseball players that you're working with these days? High school, college, and pro. Okay. And between those two, do you have a preference? Like, you know, I know that you have experience working with a lot of professional teams. Um, I'm sure that can be exciting as well, but there's also uh, a value to building relationships and building up the next generation as well. So what, what do you feel like is your, your preference there? In terms of the sports? 
uh, uh, just the age group or the, you know, because I know um, they all have their, their, their pluses and minuses. Um, you know, you have the, obviously with the professional, there's the sexiness of that, but you also have the, the politics of that. You also have yeah. the, um, but you know, on the plus side, you have the, the fact that they're they're this is their livelihood. They're much more driven in most cases to do that. And that there's a, there's a direct correlation to, um, you know, them, their, their performance and their, and their, their well-being uh, in terms of their physical, their, their, you know, not only their physical, but their financial well-being. Um, you know, as you go down the chain, down all the way into high school, obviously you have a lot more impact that you can make in terms of, um, getting them in the right direction, making impact in terms of they're much more moldable. They're much more of, of, of that soft clay that you can make into something. So they all have their pluses or minuses. I wouldn't say I have one preference towards the other. Um, and because of the way I kind of go about the, the process of my training is that there's a lot of uh, diligence done up front to make sure you're, you're the right fit for me. I don't want to just go in a situation, just train anybody who's, you know, not looking for the type of training that I'm doing. So there's a certain set of criteria uh, that that needs to be filled out, right? Um, between before you start building that relationship with them, um, I assume that's what go. Does that go into like that initial uh, first face-to-face -face meeting that you get with them, like like their fitness assessment? Yeah, and and even before that, there's there's a you know I'll invest you know sometimes I'll invest up to an hour on the phone with mm -hmm. either the athlete or or if, it, if it's a, if it's a high school kid if it, it's going to be mom or dad to say look this is not going to be similar to what most training models are all right and and the the current state of whether you're either getting skill training and in, in, or performance training a lot of it is I'm going to sign up for a bunch of sessions or I'm going to sign up for your Monday Wednesday six o'clock class. And I'm going to show up and I'm going to find usually someone who knows just a little bit more than me. That's going to show me a bunch of exercises or a bunch of drills. And I'm going to cross my fingers and I'm going to hope that they work. And that's essentially the business model of, of a large portion of our, our industry. And that's not what I do. Mine is more of a, especially with athletes, is a long-term athletic development model. So when you say, um, hey, can you work with my son who's a quarterback? What are you going to do with him? My honest answer is, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know what he needs. I don't know what his goal is. I don't know where he is now. And so I don't know. And I don't know what he needs. I can tell you how I'm going to go about it, but we can end up sending him home with um, a series of mobility drills that he needs to work on. Cause that's his biggest issue. He may need to work on his control and balance that cause that's maybe his biggest issue there. We may need to revise his strength program because he's, he's training improperly. We may need to, to work on power development, or we may need to look at a food log because his nutrition stinks. Um, there's a lot of different things that go into this. And so I don't know what you're going to need until I open up the hood. And that's where the assessment comes in. But we always have this conversation first before I ever go and measure a thing. I make sure I, you understand the conversation of what the um, process is going to be and what the expectations are going to be. And the expectations are that I'm going to find out what we need and what is the most important thing we need to do right now. And then I'm going to say, okay, these are the things that you need to do right now. And then once you can meet these criteria, well, those things aren't as important. Those things will be nice to do. They're not going to be need to do. And now we'll go to the next thing that we need to do, but that's going to be on you. That's not going to be on me. I am here as the, 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 the kind of architect of this project. If we're, you know, if I'm training you, I'm the architect of project build Greg. Right. And yeah. it's ultimately up to you to build it. I'm just going to tell you, Okay, just like you would have an architect who's building your house, I'm going to say, okay, well, this is what you need to do to do that. This is the space that you need. Here's the layout that you should use. Here's the, uh, here's where everything goes. And here's the timeline of how we're going to develop this project uh, to make sure it goes smoothly. What are some things you see that, that help you know that they're, they're ready to like get the project started? Like, what, what do you look for while you're communicating with them in that first conversation? Um, it depends if it's the, um, if it's the higher level athlete, I want to see what is their level of buy-in or are they looking, you know, they, is it almost like I'm doing, like they're doing me a favor with training with them, uh, with training them. Um, or they really recognize the value and say, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I need. This is what I'm yeah. looking for. Okay. If it's the younger athlete, 
the more talking that mom and dad do and the less talking that they do, the more that this, this, this thing's going to tank because they're not there because they want to be here. They're there because mom or dad wants them to be there because they think they're going to get a scholarship or they think they're going to make the varsity team or they're going to be the star in the newspaper. And that's, that's not going to go anywhere because again, I'm going to put the onus on them and they're going to have to take the personal responsibility to, to, to do this thing. And if, if it's, I'm here because mom or dad is bringing me here and making me come here, then it's not worth it. And I always say to them when we, when we get started that um, even after we do the assessment and I give them some homework to do, as I say, I'm going to follow up with you in four or five days. I'm going to say, how's it going with your homework? If you say, awesome, I feel so much better, or this is making such a difference, then great. We're going to schedule your next session. If I call, if I check on you in four or five days and, and you say, well, I haven't had a chance to get to it. Then I, I tell them right then and there with their parents in the room, say, I'm going to save mom and dad some money. I'm going to save me and you some time. That's it. We're done. We don't need to do go any further. It was great to meet you. Um, because if you're not going to follow through, then we're not going to get anything out of this and it's not going to work for either of us. So those, so those are some like real, real honest, open conversations that you have to have. And, and sometimes I know myself, especially, I often feel uncomfortable having conversations like that. So what, what would be your advice to in that vein? Um, cause they need to happen right in order, yeah, in order and that, for that comes to from made. Yeah. And that comes from yeah, that confidence comes from, uh, from experience. And, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to experience, you talked about before is your, one of your greatest teachers. I always joke when I teach and say, you know, I have my, uh, doctorate from SSU. It's the university of screwing shit up. And so that's <laughs> how I learned everything is by making the mistakes, but I would much rather have that. And I always say disagreements come from lack of agreements. And I'd rather say up front, this is going to be our agreement between you and I, mm. and this is what I'm going to do. And this is what you're going to do. And I'd rather have that agreement made up front than a month from now, you or mom or dad saying, I don't feel any different. I'm not any better. I'm not getting, you know, this isn't really worth it or worse. They don't say anything that any business will tell you. The worst client is the one who doesn't say anything. They just stop coming. And now all of a sudden they're going to be out there in the, in the world and in, in a world that I live on referrals, they're going to be out there in the world saying, yeah, I went to Eric. It didn't really do. I didn't, I didn't get anything out of it. Right. And so I'd rather have them, I'd rather kick them out before they, they fall on their face. And then I, and then we both look bad. This is, yeah, this is all crazy stuff. It's making me think and like, like assess how I'm going about things and, and, you know, different experiences that I've had in the past. So um, it's, it's really great to hear from you because it's kind of, it's, uh, it's confirming thoughts that I've had. And, and um, you know, I know that this episode is going to help other coaches out there, other learners out there, um, you know, operate well. And it's, you know, it's going to help me kind of choose my path and, and help direct my footsteps. So um, I know that each situation is going to be different depending on that conversation that you've had with the person, um, depending on what they do, what they need, right? Um, can you go over with me some boxes that you check off when it comes to, okay, we're getting this started. You have the behavior, like they're, they're in that state of behavior change, they're ready to go. Um, what are some things you check off on that first day with them. Okay. So, uh, the first thing is, is the first day is an, is just an assessment yeah. and, um, the information I need to gather before I even actually do any actual testing, as I always say, I need three things to write your program. I need to know your future, meaning what is your actual goal? What do we want to accomplish? How long do we have to accomplish that goal? Tell me exactly what that goal looks like. Okay. Um, and then, also, um, what type of environment are you going to be in? If you're going to be an athlete, um, I need to know everything in environment from what level you're playing at, what, you know, if you're a, um, if you're a quarterback and you're playing in a, in a high, you know, spread offense that you need to be able to run, or you're just more of a three-step drop type of thrower, you know, so all this information as far as what type, what do I need to prepare you for? What do you need to prepare? be prepared for and in, in, in your goals with that. So that's the future. I need to know your past, medical history, injury history, training history, everything that led up until today. Okay, what have you been successful with? What is, what is, uh, what if, what has not worked, all right? And all that's gonna tell me a story. And then the present is what we're gonna find out today. That's gonna be our assessment. Now, in terms of the assessment, um, 
I use a multi-tiered model and I basically took, you know, one of my primary mentors is, is Gray Cook from, you know, working together with him at FMS for, you know, over 15 years. And um, wow. he created a, a, his performance pyramid and it's three layers where there's, you know, there's movement on the bottom and then there's performance in the middle and then there's skill on top. Well, I, I took that and I kind of expanded that. Um, and then I added some layers and then added individual sections to each layer. And I use that as my teaching tool on day one to say, okay, there's, it literally blows out to 68 different things that, that incorporate into your uh, athletic performance. And I say, uh, which one do you need? Well, we don't know until we open up the hood and look. The bottom layer is health. All right. I need to make sure you're healthy first, meaning that, you know, if as long as you can come in in a wheelchair or on, on crutches, I can assume that you're physically healthy, but we may go and start doing some movement and you may experience pain. And that means we have a health issue here. Um, and so I may need to figure out why that pain is happening, but we also need to look at all the other intake information to make sure that we don't have a health issue that we're working around. Okay. Yeah. Then from there, we look at your movement. How well do you move? And I, you know, my preference obviously is my bias towards the FMS, but you should have some sort of assessment to say you have movement competency, meaning you can at least move to a, an agreeable fundamental baseline level that's acceptable before I go and add challenge. Mm. Um, if they have flaws in their movement, we may put the pump, the brakes there. If they're significantly flawed and that's their biggest area of weakness, then we're just going to focus on improving their movement and we'll give them some stuff to do on their own. And usually a lot of that stuff will clear up in the first few weeks. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't take long. We don't spend forever correcting movement. That's the big misconception is we, we get that. We want to get that out of the way and behind us as soon as possible because they came in mm -hmm. to perform better. Then, then we look at performance and we're going to do some performance testing, whether it's the, um, capacity screen, the fundamental capacity screen through FMS or other combine like type testing or specific testing uh, related to their sport. And then I also want to get a look at a little bit into their recovery. What does their nutrition look like? What does their sleep look like? What are their, their daily habits uh, look like? Um, and all of that kind of helps me paint a picture is figure out, okay, well, where do we get started? What's your weakest link? And, and let's start there uh, as well as factoring, you know, where they are, if it's an athlete, where they are in terms of their season, uh, what do they have a, a team program that they're working with and how are we going to uh, work with that, not throw that program out, but how do we work with that the best we can um, and then figure out what other things could possibly come into play in terms of uh, not only uh, a strain on their physicality, but a strain on their time. So we have to incorporate all that information so I can write a program. So I wanted to ask you uh, about testing for athletes. So mm -hmm. I usually, when I am planning on testing them, I obviously like take a look at what their, their sport is and give them something that's specific to that. Um, like, you know, whether it's a, a five ten five shuttle um, or like a 10 yard sprint to look at their acceleration, when would you say is the best time to give them that test? Um, cause ordinarily I, you know, my mindset is just like, you know, when they're the most fresh. So in the beginning of the session, after warming them up a little bit, um, but what's your take on that? And then also, um, you know, time frame and retesting, how do you, how do you, how do you take that into consideration when you're, when you're programming like certain drills for them? Okay. So the three questions I need to ask, number one, is it going to be safe? Right. Yeah. So if I just watched you, um, do a deep, you know, looked at your movement test and I look, watch you do a deep squat and it's an abomination and you have no ankle mobility and you have no postural control whatsoever. It, you know, doing your triple broad jump isn't going to do me any good other than it may put you actually at risk. And I don't want to blow anybody out on their initial assessment. So that's number one, is it even safe? Number two, is it applicable? Right. So, um, right now I'm dealing with a lot of my spring sport athletes who are, who are starting practice actually tomorrow. And I've, I've unfortunately wasted way too much of both of our time getting them ready for conditioning tests that have zero application to their sport, right? They're two mile run, um, for a spring sport athlete. And I always joke like, unless the bus breaks down two miles from your game and there's no phone service. You're never going to run two miles, right? If in baseball, a mile run is over 15 times around the bases without stopping. That doesn't happen. Um, so I don't see the application for that. 
Um, and then the, 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 uh, the last piece, most important piece, is it going to be something that's actionable? Like I see a lot of people that do a lot of assessments and whether it's a movement assessment or whether it's a, a performance a test, if you're not going to do anything about it and you don't know what to do about it, don't test it. It doesn't matter, right? So all the testing in the world is only good if you actually know how to make a difference in it. Um, so um, whether it's, you know, if you're not going to do anything with it, then, or you don't know how to do anything with it, then don't test it. When you say, um, if you don't know what to do with it, or you don't, you know, are you talking about whether or not it simulates or if, whether or not it like translate to what they do on the field or court? Um, no, that's more applicate. That's more the applicable piece. I'm talking about the actionable piece. Okay. So, so like let's say not- if I do, let's say if I do, um, uh, so I'm on the advisory board for on base university. Okay? Yeah. And so one of the, the tests we'll do is, is seated trunk rotation to look at your, your, your mobility, your thorax. So let's say you discover that I can't rotate to the right. Okay. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, if you don't have that tool, all you're going to do is go back and test in two weeks and you still don't have it because you haven't done anything with it. Right. So if you're going to apply a test, make sure you have a solution for that test. Um, so that's the, the one thing that I would say is that if you're not going to, or if you're not going to do anything about it in your program, like if you're going to go and test 40, but then you're not going to train any speed, well, what did you test it for? It's not, you're not going to do anything with that information. I hear your, uh, your, your fan in the background. Is that what, what kind of dog do you have? Uh, he's a mix. He's, he's, uh, he's full bred pain in the ass is what he is most of the time when I'm doing these. Um, but he's, he's a, he's, he's a watchdog that that's about 20 pounds and thinks he's a hundred pounds. So that's awesome. he's a, yeah. So he's a, uh, uh, terrier and dachshund. Mix. I love that. That's amazing. Um, so great. So safety, right. Is it safe? Is it applicable? Mm-hmm. Uh, do they need it? Right. And then is it actionable? Don't give a yeah. test unless you have a solution. So that exactly. that really paints a perfect picture for me. Um, when it comes to things that you want to avoid when you're when you're programming for athletes, like um, I guess you know, I, I keep coming back to common practices that that people do because I really want to hear your take on it. Um, you know what what doesn't what doesn't work when it comes to working with you know, actually improving performance and seeing improvement, like, like being able to measure it. What, what doesn't, what are some things that don't work in your opinion? The biggest thing that doesn't work is making assumptions. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to make an assumption that this person is, uh, I'll I'll try to think of, um, you know, well, I'll just go to my, go to my kind of, uh, well, I'll go to football, you know, cause I've done yeah. a lot of work in, in, in football. And yeah. the assumption is that we, is that every meeting, everybody needs a, a, the first thing you gotta do is give them a boatload of strength. And that's not always the case, right? They might, because if they can't access that strength, um, because they have mobility issues, because they have motor control issues, um, uh, or that strength is something that doesn't have direct carryover to the sport, um, then it doesn't it, it doesn't really it work. It, meaning it doesn't really fit in the program. And then uh, the second thing is is that there's there's a concept in programming that I say there's minimal, there's there's maximal, and then there's optimal. So like there's certain minimums I want to see uh, for strength in in my athletes, but once they've kind of hit those minimums. Uh, for a lot of the, the, the athletes, that's pretty much all they need. Um, maybe a little bit more depending on their position, depending on their sport, depending on their level of play. Um, and getting them to maximum, increasing their maximum may not improve their performance. So, um, so like once you get to a certain point with strength, so like people use double body weight deadlift as a, as a standard, that if I get you from double body weight to three times body weight deadlift as a wide receiver, I don't know if that's going to make a, a significant impact in your performance. Okay. And not, and so chasing more of that may not be the, the ideal use of time. Would it be nice to be stronger? Yeah, it would be nice. But when I talk about that pyramid and I have 68 different boxes I need to check, right? Strength is one of them. 
right? So if that's if that's the um, if that's the weakest link, then yeah, that's what we're going to focus on. But you know, there, there, there's probably a chance there's another box out there that's really needing needing more attention than that. So kind of getting that concept of of and, and of, uh, minimal, um, maximal, and optimal, and you don't know that if you're making an assumption, right? We're going to make an assumption that um, a golfer needs a ton of rotation, right? And I'm going to give them tons of hip rotation, tons of trunk rotation. But what if they're hypermobile and you just went through a ton of whatever mobility application that you want to use? The mobility application may be great, just not for that individual. Because if they're a hypermobile person, you may have actually made them worse. You may have actually set them up for more risk of injury. So let's say you got to that, um, like they hit their minimums and, you know, you mentioned earlier that you are working with an education model. You want to, you know, the goal is to get people to the point, um, you know, where they're working on their own and they're not getting injured. They're staying safe and they're always, you know, meeting their goals. Right. That's, that's kind of what you told me in the beginning. Um, from what do you do at that point when they get those minimums? Do you reassess and make sure, okay, is there something else we can work on? Or do you kind of send them off? How, what's, what's... Const constantly reassessing. And yeah. I yeah. have pro athletes that I work with five days a week and we've never come close to checking all those boxes and say, we're as good as we need to be with everything. Right. Um, the, the main thing is to, is to do that. So I don't guess I constantly test to yeah. see if we have enough of what we need. Um, and then from that, uh, that education model say, okay, you know, it's an open discussion. And one of the, the conversations I like to have with my athletes is I have what I call the magic wand conversation, like a magician's magic wand. And I said, if I had a magic wand in my cabinet by my desk, uh, and one, it would make my life a lot easier, both of our lives a lot easier. But if I could give you one thing, all right, you're a pitcher going out and you're standing on the mound and you're about to throw your first pitch and you think and you close your eyes and you're thinking, if I just had this one thing or the ability to do this one thing, I would be so much better. I would be at the next level, right? Or you're, you know, you're, you're stepping on the field. What is that one or what was that one thing or what are those one or two things that would make a difference to take you to the next level? And I always tell them, you don't need to answer me right now. Sometimes they say it automatically. They know they've been searching for this one thing and they can't figure it out. Um, they know it's not there, but they don't know what to do about it. Or I say, you know what, I need you to go. And, you know, next time you're, you're in your hitting lesson or next time you're at practice or you're in a game, I want you to have this in the back of your mind. I want you to come back to me with that kind of wish list of what are the things I really need to address. And then sometimes that's the feet, that's where the relationships come in, where I can have a conversation with their pitching coach. I can have a conversation with their hitting coach or their position coach mm. and say, okay, what do you see that we need to work on? And they'll, and, and that's how I got to a lot of the relationships I have with a lot of skill coaches is that I would go and just sit and watch a lesson and they would be telling, you know, you know, telling somebody, Hey, you need to try to get your hips through, or you need to be able to turn your shoulders over your hips or not pull your head off. And I would sometimes interrupt say, Hey, you know, we can call time out. I, he understood, I said, do you understand what he's asking you to do? And they say, yeah, I just can't do it. And I'm like, yeah, he, he can't do it. You can tell him all day. His body physically can't, doesn't have the ability to do that. And so let's try this. Stop the lesson for one second. Try doing these two things. That's going to give him some awareness of how to do that and then get them to do a few repetitions and gain a little bit. And then now go back and try it. And they say, okay, well, it's not perfect, but I, now I can actually understand. I, you, you've given me a language now that I can communicate um, and do that. And so that's where that, that wish list kind of comes in and that magic wand conversation of being able to figure out what is the, what is the next thing. And, and sometimes it's the test that will tell you. And sometimes it's just the plain, having an open conversation with your athletes because they know what's holding them back. They may not know why, but they know what, what the end result is that they're hold, that's holding them back. Got you. So you'd say that's part, like part of the importance of building those relationships is making that, that time outside of your training sessions to go, uh, to go and visit them when they're doing, you know, skills training, let's say, or, or even when they're at games, right. Is that something you, you make an effort to, uh, to do with many of your clients? 
that or they'll send me video of, of them throwing a bullpen or they'll send me video of something, you know, them running, you know, running their sprints or saying, Hey, you know, do you see what I'm doing with my arm here? I don't know why I'm doing that. Is that something we could work on? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, absolutely. Having that, having that conversation. And, And then I also do, you know, there's a, there's a quick, you know, readiness screen that I do all with everybody I work with, uh, on a consistent basis that I do the first thing they walk in the door and it's their own self check because we may have assessed you day one, but day one might've been three weeks ago. And since that time we've done that assessment, you're maybe now a different organism that stood in front of me from three weeks ago. So I need to go through a quick screen. I don't need to go through your full assessment again, but I have a, a pretty um, uh, a file down three minute quick readiness test that I do with everybody. And that usually tells me where they're at for that day. And that's going to tell me what I, because that program I wrote, wrote was based on the version of you I saw two or three weeks ago. Now I may need to adjust that program based on what walked in the door today. So that may mean Mm -hmm. that based on what I see, Hey, you're actually way above where you normally are today may be the day to push it a little bit and try a new PR or, or learn a new skill or add a little bit of volume to this workout or today, um, you know, something's not right. And we may need to slow down a little bit and we may need to make some adjustments today um, and maybe remove some things or add some things and, and just kind of tweak the workout a little bit based on what I'm seeing here. Um, Cause maybe normally you can touch your toes with no problem, but today you were a little hesitant and, and you're a little bit restricted. So we were supposed to do kettlebell swings, but with that type of, you know, forward bending and hip hinging, I don't feel comfortable. So let's do a few things up front to see if we can clear that up and then go back and recheck that toe touch. If it clears it up, we can proceed as planned. If it doesn't clear it up, well, now we need to adjust and we're going to pull that out. Or there's some days you come in and you are just, you look like you got hit by a truck and all your numbers are down, whether it's your breath hold score, your grip strength, your, your motor control screen, any of the things that I do as part of this readiness. And then I'm like, all right, something's up here. What's going on? And they say, yeah, I didn't sleep last night or I ate crap or I went drinking or whatever. And now, okay, well, guess what? Today's program just got scrapped. We need to, you know, go to plan B and plan B may be just a recovery day or just a movement based day or, mm-hmm. um, you know, that sort of thing, because I can't give you the program that I wrote for you because you're, you're not going to be able to handle it. And all I'm going to do is crush you. And that's not going to get us anywhere. I think one of the biggest things that's impacted me so far in this conversation is that idea of like, don't assume anything. Cause you, everything you're telling me is like, you know, the retesting, looking at them when they walk through the door, even having that, you know, that three minute assessment too, like it's, it's not, you're not always going to stick to that one program. It sounds like you need to make changes, like depending on what, what that, what that organism is like that day. Like I remember a handful of times when I would, and I still do it. Like sometimes like I'll be concerned about like sticking to the program or whatever I wrote up, but then I'm thinking like, it's, it's, it's about that person. So change it up and it's and it's all it's 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 like an experiment in a way um so that's great that's awesome and then now with the tech that's out there with with looking at readiness whether they have an aura ring a whoop band a morpheus band all these different things the apple uh, watch you can even look at their physiological readiness and you know they that's where kind of the finding some of that information and using that in uh, as an art to say, my goal is to push you as hard as I can possibly push you without breaking you down. Mm. So you come back stronger the next time. Now that bar, that, that bar moves on you. Right. And so if you sleep, if you're rest and regen, if you're, um, you know, whatever's happening the rest of your day, you might've shoveled snow the day before yeah. all that stuff is going to move that meter to what your max is for that given day. And so what I want to do is see where that, that, goal line is and i'm going to try to get as close to that as possible without going past it i gotta get myself a whoop i've been uh putting it off but those things are awesome and uh have you have you seen the um i don't know how accurate it is but have you seen the in body um wearable where like in body is the machine that does the uh the body composition have Mm -hmm. you seen those in body wearables before Everybody's coming out with a wearable now. Um, there's varying degrees of accuracy with that. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at it because training is cumulative. I look at the recovery as being cumulative. And if I'm noticing that 
Um, it tells me a couple things. Any retest that I do, it tells me it, it doesn't, it's not so much of, if I'm training you, Greg, it's not so much that I'm retesting you to see if you're doing your work. I want to test myself to see if my stuff is even working. Um, Cause I don't, I don't, I, I say, I believe none of what I hear and half of what I see. So I want to be able to, to make sure that it's actually working. And, and if it's not, I need to change course. We're not going to go six, eight weeks into this thing to realize it doesn't work. Um, yeah. We're going to figure out pretty quickly if we're on the right path. Um, so any of the tech that can give me that feedback, whether it's a, uh, a recovery tool like a whoop or Morpheus or any stuff you're talking about, whether it's a push band that tells me, you know, some in some velocity based training that tells me that what's your, your power output, looking at those sorts of things, whether it's as simple as your numbers in, on your chart to say, um, you know, normally we work with, you know, 50 pounds with this and, and now all of a sudden you're getting, you know, the number of reps and you're, you still have 10 more in the tank where when we first started this, that was all you had. And so the art of this is, and I, the, the first discussion I have on day one of training with every individual and every team that I train, is I said, for this to work, we need this to be two things. You need to be challenged. That's the whole reason exercise works, right? Mm -hmm. you, you challenge yourself and your body goes, holy crap, I don't know what you just did, but <laughs> you're going to keep doing that. I have to get better able at doing that. And your cells will adjust, whether it's, yeah being more efficient, whether it's, um, whether it's adding more muscle or adding more tensile strength. And so with that, you need to be challenged, but you also need to be successful. Meaning that if I just, you know, smoke you, um, which unfortunately a lot of people think that's what training is. If I just smoke you, but then you're, you're toast for the next five days, then I wasn't really successful right? in, in my mind. Um, and so that's on the macro and the micro, if, if you can, bench press 200 pounds and I put a hundred pounds on the bar, you'll be really successful. You just won't be all that challenged. I don't know if it's going to be enough to, to make a significant change, but if we put 300 pounds on the bar, yeah, you'll be really challenged. You'll get sawed in half by the thing because you won't be successful. So the art is finding that what we call the edge of your ability where maybe 205 is just the right amount where you're challenged and successful and it's going to create a positive feedback. Um, but if 205 works today, and then the next week we go back and do that same exercise and 205 is now way too easy. Well, that's our feedback that we need to challenge more and put more on the bar. If 205 goes and buries you today, then, you know, then maybe there's something different about you today, your readiness, maybe you're overtrained or maybe this program is hit towards its, its end mark. Um, and we need to make an adjustment. I see. Very awesome. Thank you. Um, I, I want to get into your, um, experiences teaching to uh, public speaking, I mean, to different audiences and, and different scenarios, and then actually a little bit on your work uh, too with more of the professional sports teams. But one other quick question I had, uh, when it comes to breath work and breathing combined with movement, um, do you have a specific approach? Like, do you use it in conjunction with core exercises or what's, what's mainly going on there for you? It's in conjunction with everything. Yeah. Um, it's one of the first things that, that we teach. I say, you know, you can go for, you know, you can go for days without, uh, days without food. You can go for, for a while without water. You can only go for a couple, a couple minutes without air at best. It is the most essential thing, right? That's what tells us if we're alive or dead, if we're, if you can fog up a mirror. And so, um, it is, you know, that's why they, they call that the essence of your, of your life energy in, in, certain cultures and call it your chi or, or, or what have you. And so it is extremely important, but you can't apply the same breathing to every single thing you do. Um, there's a certain type of breathing that I'll teach you in terms of kind of a reset um, or, or recover type of breathing. We're going to teach you more deep, um, full, you know, for lack of a better terms, belly breathing. If someone's really an expert in breathing, it's, we know it's not exactly that, but there's more deep, full recovery, reset type breathing. And then there's a different type of breathing that if I want to create a lot of tension um, that I would do where I would, you know, breathe behind the shield and do all these sorts of tension upregulators that I would do if I'm going to do a heavy deadlift or squat or, or something of that effect. And then there's a different type of breathing. If I want to express power or speed, like a martial artist would, would spit the air out or you hear a grunt from a tennis athlete, that's a different type of breathing. And then you get into the type of breathing that you would do in, types of, in terms of your conditioning and teaching athletes the importance of nasal breathing 
um, not only when they're conditioning, but also, you know, throughout their day and incorporating that into their conditioning. A lot of tools in the toolbox for different scenarios. Um, that sounds like I, I definitely want to look into that because I think that's, I feel that's extremely valuable and I don't necessarily use it as much. I mean, I like doing it for recovery, um, like post training session too. That's kind of like the extent of what I would do, but, um, I, I definitely like, that's amazing. Like I'm going to look into that more. Uh, I don't think there's a single drill I've ever given anybody that doesn't incorporate breathing in some way, shape or form. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, cause another thing I do as well is like, it's, it's, it's always, you know, breathing out, um, when you make that first initial effort. I mean, that's this mainly just, just for like lifting or doing, um, like a standard weight exercise, right? I mean, it's like breathing out with the concentric and then X like inhaling with uh, the stretch of the eccentric part. Like, how do you feel about that specific technique? Possibly depends yeah. on what you're doing. I, can, I could break down breathing. I can have you doing a, um, a, a circuit of five exercises with a different breathing technique for each one. That's so cool. That's awesome. So, and it's because it's dependent on what the goal of the exercise is, the, the duration of the exercise, the, um, the, uh, what phase of movement the exercise is, is it eccentric? Is it, is it, is it isometric? Is it, is it concentric? Is it a full dynamic movement? How long is the tempo on that movement? Um, there's a lot that goes into it. And so literally I would teach you a different breath technique for almost every exercise. A lot of my, um, gen pop clients, uh, have a hard time bracing their core uh to stabilize during exercise and then like when i when i tell them like to breathe at the same time they have a hard time with that um what are some things that i can keep in mind when when helping them out um well the there's some great tension feeding techniques that you can find from pavel satsalon uh in his in his uh Naked Warrior book, oh. where he basically builds you to, to do a single arm push up or a single leg pistol squat. Uh, there's a lot of elegance and brilliance in there. Uh, getting people to understand the importance of their breathing, you know, getting them to get some tactile feedback. When you put in getting a hand on their chest, a hand on their belly, learning to understand the difference between a, uh, a someone who's more of a apical breather up into their chest or someone who breathes down into their belly, get them to put their fingertips on their abs and say to breathe out hard and feel what happens there. Um, and getting them to experience the different things and understand that I not only expand out, I, uh, front anterior, posterior, I expand laterally. So all these things, getting them to, to feel those types of things and try to get them to recreate it is, is probably the biggest, biggest tool. Right. Cause then like once they, know what's happening and then the difference between like the it's all about like you know um establishing better patterns and, and better routines so if they know like the right way versus the wrong way right yeah so. and and then depending on uh, i may give them specific homework with their breathing as well to practice that okay all right thank you so you've been, you've been to a lot of different places. You've, you've spoken to a lot of different people. Um, you know, one thing that I found very interesting in your profile is that you, you've spoken to like Navy SEALs and, you know, U S army before. Um, so out of all these kind of conferences and all these, um, you know, speaking venues that you've been at, what's the one that you feel like you, I guess, had the best time at. And then also like the one that you felt you made the most impact at. Um, uh, let's see. There's, there's a, there's a couple good ones that I've had some great opportunities with. Um, yeah, obviously working with the military, I'm in awe of the, of anybody in the military. And especially when you get up to those higher levels, uh, and getting to work with the people who work with the special forces and, um, that I'm, I'm in just absolute awe of, of, of what they do and, and, and the respect they have for them is in, in immense. Um, and then, you know, along those lines, one of the, you know, one that stands out my, in, in my head is, is I've gotten to, to speak, I've had uh, either in my, either in my FMS classes, or I actually did a, a private course for the LA County Fire Department. Um, and just seeing people who really didn't have a background necessarily in exercise, but were looking to incorporate 
uh, this in. And those people are like real life rescue heroes. These aren't, you know, getting cats out of a tree type of a firefighter. These are flying black hawks into wildfires um, type of people. And so that, you know, the, the, having the, the, the um, opportunity to speak to them was awesome. Um, getting to speak internationally um, is a very cool thing because there's a huge language barrier. And whether it's speaking in Asia or speaking in South America, being able to connect with people and seeing that, hey, we're dealing with some of the same kind of stuff and being able to have this, this international language of, of movement and, and uh, performance and, and trying to get the, the, the most out of our clients and athletes is a very cool thing to be able to do that without being able to necessarily communicate the same language and to try to get your message across through a translator and hoping that message is landing and trying to figure out if that message is landing is always a very unique experience. Um, and then, you know, probably one of my uh, coolest things is I got to speak at, we used to run summits uh, with functional movement systems and uh, I got to speak at, I think the last one that we held, I think was 2014 and I got to speak at that. And that was, personally, uh, one of my favorite ones, cause I got to speak in front of all my mentors and, you know, I had Gray Cook and Lee Burton and Greg Rose, oh, wow. and all these people in, in, you know, in the audience. And that was probably the most nervous I've ever been. Cause I never get nervous speaking other than in, in that case, but that was a very, uh, very, very cool experience for me. Have you spoken at perform better before? Uh, I've did, uh, I just did I, since everything's been virtual, I just did their perform better Europe virtually. Um, and, and so, uh, um, I haven't done any of their, uh, of their other conferences, but I've done, you know, an academy. I, I just, I'm actually doing one, um, for ACSM, their international conference. I just did a pre-recorded bit and then I'm doing a live Q and a with them, uh, in two weeks. Oh, I was going to, yeah, I was going to ask you as well. What are some like upcoming future, um, you know, events that you were going to speak as or anything else that comes to mind? Uh, the most, uh, the, the ones that are, um, coming up the soonest would be the, like I said, the American college of sports medicine, their international conference. Um, I think they just opened up where you can start viewing the, the pre-recorded stuff. And then there's live Q and A's, uh, not this weekend, but the following weekend, um, I'll be teaching a, uh, a level one, level two combination virtual course, uh, for FMS with Lee Burton. Um, in May, that is, uh, May 21st and 22nd. Um, that's, that's the next two things on the agenda. Where can myself and others, uh, act like find, um, I mean, I, at the end, I usually do like a, like a plug for all mm -hmm. of your stuff, but, um, I'm really interested in finding out where I can do those, um, especially the ACSM, uh, and the FMS thing that you're going to do. Um, where, where can I sign up? <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for this one. I believe if you, oh. you just search for American College of Sports Medicine um, International Conference, you'll find that. Uh, I believe okay. it's acsm.org. Um, but uh, Functional Movement Systems is just functionalmovement.com and look under courses and you can find uh, the uh, course coming up in May. Perfect, man. Thank you so much. So in your experience with uh, working with professional athletes, you have you have a a colorful uh a list of teams that you you've been with before um was it mainly uh the massive group environment like you going to them or did you know was it people coming to you one-on-one -on -one? what was the breakdown there and, and i've had i've had both yeah. um uh the team relationships were you know i've gone on and i've gone in and done uh fms um workshops for multiple professional teams. Um, I also was a consultant for the New York Giants for nine years. Uh, and in that case, I would go in and, and we would do movement testing on all the players, um, me and my staff, and then I would be there twice a week in the weight room working with players um, alongside with the strength coach um, to kind of work on anything that they had going on. And the beauty of the, the beauty and the sad part of the NFL is that the, there's never going to run out of stuff to fix yeah i can get that 100 percent. a lot of injuries um was there something you you feel like you saw the most with football players uh football in general you usually see the the, the two biggest issues is ankle mobility and shoulder mm -hmm. mobility um 
And so because of that, you know, that's where you see, you know, ankles will create issues all the way up the chain. Um, and the shoulder mobility will <clears throat> lead to any of the upper body issues that we see, whether it's shoulder or neck, even some low back stuff because of that. Yeah, it's crazy. And if you have an issue in one spot, it's not always there. Like you got to look above and below to see what's going on. Right. And that's regional interdependence. That's the whole idea. Yeah. I like that. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about like what your first, well, first of all, do, do you, when you would work with the teams, would you introduce yourself as like your, a strength and conditioning coach or were you, uh, you know, a trainer? Like how, how did you kind of, what was your title at the time and, and what did your first day well, with the, them usually look like? The key with them or any of the teams I've worked with, even the high school teams yeah. is, um, my light here. Um, is that um, I explained to him, look, I'm a strength coach, but I'm not your strength coach, right? You have a strength coach. I'm going to work alongside with them and support what they do. I'm here to help you uh, with whatever it is that they've, they brought in. Um, now, in some cases, it, in some of the high schools I work with, they don't have a strength coach. They have their skill coach. They have their football coach or baseball coach. And I'm there not to be there every day with them with a cup of coffee in the newspaper to run their, through their lifts. I'm there to give them what they need, whether that's an on-field session, whether that's um, in the weight room, whether it's a recovery session, what have you. But specific to the, to the professional teams, I say, look, just what I said, I'm, I'm here to work alongside. And I was in, in, in the case, um, where I would be a liaison between the training staff and the strength staff. So um, let's say you, I, I get the trainers would come to me and say, Hey, look, this guy tweaked his hamstring running down on a kickoff. Um, we'll treat his hamstring. You figure out kind of what, what's going on there. And I can relay it back to them and say, well, yeah, he, he's got a stuck left ankle. He's got no hip rotation on his right side and he's got um poor, you know, control in his, in his leg raise. So I'll work on that stuff. You work on the hamstring. Let's meet back in a couple of days and see where we're at. Um, or the strength coach, I would be there and they, they, I'd have a guy walk up to me and say, Hey, you know, strength coach said to come see you. Cause I'm, I'm, I got, I can't, I keep shifting left in my squat. He can't figure out why, can you figure out why? And then I'm going to do that and feed him back to the strength coach to do his program. So that's kind of how it was positioned there. That's awesome. Would you say that's like, like that's pretty much the standard of how things operate with a strength, no. like multiple strength coaches. Okay. No, there is, gotcha. there is no standard from no. team to team, from sport to sport. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of politics. There's a lot of ego. There's a lot of protecting of your turf. And um, so with that, you know, in an ideal, you know, utopia, everybody, uh, works together and everybody is harmonious and, and, you know, doesn't step on any toes, but that's not the reality. The reality and is that every, you know, people are trying to protect their jobs. People are trying to, uh, and they know that that's something that you could lose at any day. And so, uh, they're going to be protective of someone like me from the outside coming in. So there's a lot of effort that goes into building trust and rapport to say that I'm not looking to take your job or I'm not looking to make you look bad at all. I'm, I'm actually here to make your job easier and make you look good. Mm, perfect. And I'm not looking to take credit for any of it. Can you think of a, um, a, you know, a quick story where you had a situation with an athlete or, you know, someone else that you were responsible uh, for teaming up with for that athlete that there was like, there was like kind of like a challenge that you guys had to face, whether it was like physical with the athlete's performance or like, you know, just communication, anything like that. And then th this is like something that you saw, like was kind of difficult to work through. And then you did end up working through it for the betterment of everyone involved without naming names. Mm. There's, there's a lot of stories over, over the 20 plus years I've been doing it. There's, you know, the, the, the hardest stories are the ones when you have an athlete that there's, there's uh, you know, it's the end of the line and, you know, no matter what we do, there's just, you know, there's not a place for them to play. 
And so their, their time has run out. And some people, you know, for some of us, our athletic careers ended in high school. Some get fortunate enough to play in college, some fortunate to play at the pros, but we're all told one day that it's that you're done. Um, and so realizing that we've been working at something and it's not, and no matter what we do, there's just not the interest there and it's done. That's, that's a, that's a, one of the more difficult on the downside of things or the downside of things to say, you know, injuries do happen. There are some cases where you're going to get pulled out of your sport or you may be, you know, taken your sport may be taken away from you because of something that happens. And, and sometimes it's completely out of our control. We could have, you know, I've had, I can think of one kid in particular that um, he had had a slight tear in his ACL. The doctor said, we're not going to uh, operate because of where he was. He was going into his senior year. Um, he was looking to get recruited. And so he said, let's do the best we can. And they opted to not do surgery. And we worked really hard. And, th- and this kid really did everything I asked him to do. And we got to the point by his opening game that he was running, cutting, he was a hundred percent. He was, um, he was doing unbelievable. And the, and the doctors, you know, said, there's no reason you can't play. You look great. And he goes, I don't know what you did, but you pulled it off. And he goes out and he goes to his first game. And in the first quarter, he he's running the ball. He plants his foot and a helmet comes flying into his knee, blows out his own knee. Had nothing to do with the previous injury. It was going to happen if he had the greatest knee in the world. You just can't control that. Um, so that's mm-hmm. kind of both sides of the story where we saw, yeah. you know, an incredible outcome and that's what we could control. And that was really cool to see, but then there's things you can't control. That's, that's the, the, the life of sports. Um, you know, there's been some pretty cool stuff I've gotten to see over the years. Um, you know, so I, I could probably go on for stories for days, but um, we don't have days. So I'll, I'll leave it at yeah. that. Okay. Thank you. That, that really, you know, helps me get some perspective. Um, and it, and it leads kind of into one of my last questions for you, um, which, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to apply specifically to people who are starting off in a profession, uh, people who are still working their way through what they're, um, what they're doing. And, you know, you mentioned, things that you can control and things like outside of your control that are completely unpredictable. Right. Um, but basically my question for you is, um, early in your career, did you feel like there was a time when you were uncertain whether or not you were on the right path? Um, and maybe you felt like you were in the wrong spot. Um, and if so, was there a way that you dealt with that personally? Um, that's making the assumption that I, that there's days that now that I don't feel like I'm in the right spot. Um, and so, um, cause I'm, I'm, you told me not, you told me not to assume and I went and assumed. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, and the the biggest reason for that is cause I'm always trying to, the only way to grow is to get outside of your comfort zone. And when you do that, you're going to get in scenarios where you realize, you know what, this isn't, I don't, you know, where I, you know, I've had scenarios where I've had, um, organizations that said, uh, Hey, we really like what you do. We want to bring you in. We want this, you know, we want you to work with our athletes. And then it sounds great. And we've had meetings leading up to it. And it sounds like it's exactly, and we had everything best laid plans. And then the sessions start happening and it's like, no, this is not what you said it was going to be. And this is not the environment that I had in mind. And now I'm kind of committed to this off season program. And it's like, this is, you know what, this isn't the right spot. And so I just know it's a learning experience. And next time I'm not, you know, when they call back for next year, I'm going to say, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, Cause this isn't, this wasn't what we envisioned. Yeah. And you just kind of have to, you know, just reassess again and, and kind of move on. Right. You just take the L and move on. But, exactly. Yeah. But if you don't do that and you don't get outside your comfort zone, you're, you're, you know, you're never going to grow. Well, that's what I'm working on. And I think that's, that's, I mean, as you said, it's an ongoing process. You're never really going to stop. So I um, really appreciate that. It's, it's more for me to take into consideration and take to heart. And, you know, I'd like to, you know, once again, thank you for coming on the show because I've learned a lot and I can't wait to go back in and dissect it and, and 
read through it, listen through it again. Um, but thank you for taking the time, man, um, to come out to sets and reps. Um, we like to live out every day here. Like it's one giant set and you got to put in the reps to get the results that you're looking for. So I really appreciate you. Thank you. Cool. Thanks for having me anytime. Um, can you take a second and kind of plug your websites, plug where people can find you and, uh, and learn more about you? Yeah, that's simple. Just go to uh, my websites. My name, Eric Degatti, E-R-I-C-D-A-G-A-T-I.com. Um, there's even a thing on the homepage because I do so many of these things and I teach so much. It's called Ask Eric. And if you just add, add, put a question in there, it'll go to my email. And I usually get back to people within about a week or so with any questions that they have. So, Yeah, you were very quick getting back to me. So I thank you again. That was mm-hmm. awesome. Um, all right, perfect. Eric Degatti, sir, have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. Thank you You very much. Thank you, Greg. All right. Take care. Thanks.